Welcome to Quant Minds International here in Vienna. I'm Joanna Simpson. Joining me now is Julia Spack, Quant Strategies Specialist at Saracen and Partners. Thank you very much for joining me. Oh, my pleasure, Joanna. And to what extent is passive asset management better than active asset management? It's a good question and question asked at you know many events and um, our clients. And I'd like to start this answer by actually providing a bit of clarification to terminologies that we use around passive and active because I believe uh, that the, the classification is a bit outdated. Uh, we need to move from this passive active. So what is passive, inv uh, passive investing? effectively buying and holding a uh, market portfolio. And by convention, academics and practitioners have been using market cap weighted portfolio to proxy exposure to the market. Um, so by definition, any portfolio which is not market cap weighted is not passive, right? So you take a equally weighted portfolio. So uh, it's a simply constructed rules based strategy, yet it can produce a tracking error of five. Is this passive? No, it's not. Hence, a better classification would be systematic, so rules-based approach versus discretionary, which is discretionary-based approach. And then when we look at the spectrum, uh, then, then we end up with a spectrum of systematic strategies coming from market cap to enhanced to uh, factor investing all the way to high frequency space. And uh, coming back to your question as to what extent is systematic better than discretionary, Effectively, you know, each has its own features and sort of uh, advantages, disadvantages. But what I would like to answer here is what it um, what it achieves better because it does achieve certain goals better than than uh, discretionary, and it is exposure to systematic risk premium. So, uh, systematic strategies because of the diversification, representation, and its rules-based approach enable us to better harvest systematic risk premium in a cheaper and much more cost-efficient way. So what are the risks of active asset management? Um, I believe, well, coming back again to what I just sort of um, clarified in terms of classifications so of discretionary and systematic, uh, I will break this question into or break my answer in two parts. One would be the um, sort of asset allocators or investors angle and the other would be the managers angle. So in terms of um, uh, the goals of discretionary, man, uh, discretionary investment style, it should provide us exposure to idiosyncratic risks. We don't want to um, go with the discretionary investment to get exposure to market beta. Hence, uh, investor would not want to pay uh, so-called active fees for, for beta. So for an investor, there is always a risk related to manager selection and uh, or manager deviating from what was promised an investment um, strategy when it was sold. So uh, deviation from you know, from actually exposure to those idiosyncratic risks. Now, from uh, uh, hence we had also all the so-called crackdown on a closet tracker funds, right? So, uh, so coming back to the uh, second part of the uh, answer to this question, I'd like to bring in the market skewness and how does it affect, or how? Uh, what are the implications of positive market skewness for discretionary managers? So, uh, as we said in the first part of my answer, discretionary managers should provide investors with idiosyncratic risk exposure. And uh, interestingly, and uh, it is an empirical fact observed across the geographical markets and uh, across different uh, periods in time, there is a very strong evidence of positive skewness in um, returns of equity markets. In other words, uh, in a broad market index such as MSCI World, there would be a subset of securities which perform the returns of the securities being substantially better than other stocks in, in, in the index. Hence, um, having the situation where you have a small set of uh, constituents of an index performing very, very well, and on the other hand, you have discretionary manager who is pursuing a very, a very high conviction approach with the, say, 30, 40 stocks. It becomes difficult for discretionary managers in the presence of positive market skewness to outperform a market, uh, market cap index, which by definition would have that subset of the so-called winners or uh, strongly performing securities. So is there an ideal balance between active and passive asset management? 
Well, uh, for a long-term investor, um, a portfolio should be constructed with uh, well two critical pillars, uh, strategic asset allocation and tactical uh, exposure. So strategic is a core which provides us a um, exposure to systematic drivers of an asset class. Uh, whilst on the other hand, uh, tactical um, or satellites uh, should provide us exposure to idiosyncratic risks in a portfolio. Uh, so as established from the previous uh, answers in this in this discussion, uh, the systematic risk premium is best achieved through systematic uh, investment style, which is more cost efficient. It is very represented, uh, very representable and diversified and rules based and obviously way cheaper than uh, idiosyncratic or high conviction portfolios. On the other hand, the um, exposure to idiosyncratic risk should come through high conviction portfolios and uh, discretionary managers are best at doing that. In terms of an ideal mix, uh, well, ideal really depends on, you know, on, on investment horizons, on a risk appetite uh, of an investor. Hence, in case of a pension scheme, that would depend on maturity of the pension scheme, on the contribution, on the funding rate. So there could be multiple, multiple variables which would determine that. But in a nutshell, it is really two core pillars which should be present in investors' portfolio, strategic and tactical. Yulish Pak from Saracen and Partners, thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure.